coming up on this week in Radio Tech. We're going straight to the moon. Well, not quite. Rocket telemetry, radio telemetry is our topic today with Cornelius Gould. It's a little off topic, but it's radio and it's pretty fun. It's coming up next on Twert. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, keeping you connected with your community with support and webinars. Online at nautel.com slash webinars. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the microphone to the uh, light bulb at the top of the tower. There, there it is right there. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and so glad to be here. It's a Thursday afternoon, 4 o'clock Central Time, 5 o'clock on the East Coast. And this is, uh, this is the show where we just talk about the stuff that has to do with radio broadcasting. And that includes a lot of things. I mean, anything from putting a dime or a penny on the uh, tone arm to keep the record from skipping, all the way <laughs> fast forward to digital technologies and transmission schemes and internet. And uh, uh, today we've got some really interesting radio telemetry things to talk about. That is coming up uh, with our, our guest, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, unfortunately, Chris Tobin can't be here today. He's in a uh, COVID-19 meeting at work. Uh, so they're working out procedures for getting people back together. And maybe he'll have a report for us uh, next time. Before we get into uh, our guest here, um, I want to uh, make a quick announcement uh, from my friends at Nautel. They have a new ebook that's uh, out and available. I made a black and white copy of the front of it Nine Mistakes to Avoid When Buying a Transmitter. Nine Mistakes to Avoid When Buying a Transmitter. I would highly suggest checking this thing out. Um, here's what you do uh, well, first of all, Transmission Talk Tuesday. Yes, Nautel is still doing that. They're extending it into August because the response every week has been so good. These are roundtable discussions, and that means you get to participate. It's not a one-to-many sort of thing. It's not a lecture, uh, although they do have expert guests on. Uh, you get to participate because it's a roundtable. To register, it's easy. Go to nautel.com slash webinars. Nautel.com slash webinars. You can see the topics there, and to register... Um, the big news this week, Nautel has just published this ebook entitled Nine Mistakes to Avoid When Buying a Transmitter. That's geared toward both general managers and engineering managers. You can, it discusses details that could be overlooked during the decision making process and questions that you need to be asking yourself, uh, need to be asking other people who you work with, and perhaps even asking uh, the salespeople or company that you're thinking about buying a transmitter from. Here's how you get this ebook. Go to nautel.com slash the number nine hyphen mistakes. So nine mistakes with a hyphen in there. Uh, we'll put that link in the show notes. You can download this ebook to avoid the nine common mistakes that can add to your costs and delay installation. And I've, I'm looking over these here. These are good things. Some of these I would think of. Some of these I maybe wouldn't think of. So it's a good book to have. You can, you can download. I registered for it and downloaded it uh, from their website just a couple hours ago. Nine mistakes to avoid when buying a transmitter. They'll send you a link to the PDF. You can read it uh, on your computer. You can print it out and you can save color ink if you really want to, like I did, because I'm a cheapskate. There you go. Thanks, Nautel, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. And we're glad to make these announcements for you. Don't forget the webinars. Nautel.com slash webinars. All right. Let's bring in our guest. Uh, I've heard him chuckling a bit in the background because he knows the score. He knows uh, he's a radio engineer, or ha has been. He's a he's a has been radio engineer, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my friend Cornelius Gould. Hey, Corny, welcome in. Hey, Kirk, how you doing? Nice I'm being good. on the show with you again. Well, and and where are you? You're on some kind of a, a television podcast set. Looks like. Uh, actually, we uh, haven't gotten much into television podcasts on our end, but it is my studio for the podcast that I do, a uh, bi-weekly podcast with uh, all the Rocketeers called The Rocketry Show. And uh, you can find it at therocketreeshow.com. So that's where I am. And we have our sister uh, podcast, modelrocketshow.com, which is a um, show that starts with all the Estes rockets that you can buy in the store and fly them in the park and all that. And then The Rocketry Show is all about the advanced stuff that uh, rocketeers are doing these days and part of what we're talking about now. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to get into that. I want to, for those people who don't know you, and I've known you for yes. 
probably uh, close to 20 years. I, th I met you in Cleveland, yes. Ohio, I believe, at what, the CBS mm -hmm. stations? Yeah. Uh, what were you doing yeah. there? It, it, uh, that was their uh, senior staff engineer um, for the, the CBS cluster in Cleveland. Um, and uh, yeah, I did that. For, I was there for about like 10 years or so. Before that, I was a Telos customer support. So we may have hmm. like initially brushed, you know, paths in there or in the mid 90s <laughs> uh, or so. So yeah. there you go. That's the and early that, part of me with the radio stuff. And then from from CBS radio in Cleveland, you came on board uh, the same company that I work with. Yes, at uh, Telus Alliance and uh, working with Frank Foti, developing the uh, Omni 11 um, audio processor with him and the rest of the team. And um, yeah, and uh, moved on to other things after that. And these days I'm doing the uh, the podcasts and also uh, doing a bit of radio engineering again as a contractor uh, these days for uh, John Carroll, uh, WJCU here, and doing some work with the station down close to me as well. So. You, you and I have right. done some shows uh, specifically ab about the G-Force algorithm, which is a, a, mm -hmm. a whole set of algorithms and and uh, topology yes. that you came up for to improve uh, or to upgrade or to give a different sound to the Omni 11 uh, audio processor. And yes. I, I want to tell you what what impressed me. Uh, the biggest my biggest takeaway from that is that most audio processors have, you know, a section here and a section here and a section mm -hmm. here. And each section does a thing. Right. Multiband yes. this multiband yes. limiting that. Um, and you said, you know, these these sections need to talk to each other. So that yes. if one of them's working really, really hard, maybe you can tell the guy before it, I'm working really hard. Um, it may sound better if you kind of step in and do your part. <laughs> so you came up with this overall management scheme to manage the different people, the different, the different, because <laughs> I think of them as people, right? Because when, when, when yes. a lay person says, Hey Kirk, how does an audio processor work? <laughs> well, in the front of it, there's a little man with a volume control and he, he's really <laughs> old. He's old and slow and sleepy. And you know, if the music gets too loud and starts bothering him, he just reaches up and turns it down a little bit, you know, and if it gets too, if he can't <laughs> hear it anymore, he, he turns it up a little bit. And then the next guys are younger guys. The, the, they're, they're adjusting the, the sound a little faster, you know, turning it up, uh, turning it down, wh whatever it needs. And then the, the, the limiter guys, the guys that are in the multiband limiter, there's like five or six of them. The, these guys are on a combination of cocaine and speed and, and <laughs> <laughs> they, they're working their volume controls really fast. So, uh, or, yeah, that's not exactly how it works, the, but anyway, or for you those figure out a way to manage all those, these guys. Yes. Or another way to put the guys in the back for those of us old enough to remember the uh, little rascals were the episode where they're in the, uh, radio station with the sound engineer, you know, this, the guy on the control. And if it's, if it's loud enough to make his hat fly off and his hair shoot up, then he's got to turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. Oh, I gotta see that. Oh my gosh. That's a real yeah, little they, rascals episode. Yeah. They were the little rascals were on the air at a radio station, old 1930s radio studio. And they kept uh, doing things loudly that would cause the, the, the main engineer, the soundboard engineer guy to, to react in ways like, oh, his hat would fly off and his hair would be shooting straight up because it was so loud, whatever they're doing. <laughs> I, I'll, I wonder if that's on YouTube. I got to look that up. My, my mom and my dad used to watch Little Rascals when they were kids. Mm. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. So uh, we, we can talk about algorithms, uh, but I want to give people a sense of, of what you did. You have this broad understanding of, of audio and how it's supposed to sound, but more important than that, your your background as an engineer informs you as to you know all kinds of technologies, including uh, mm -hmm. telemetry uh, over radio uh, waves, you know, radio telemetry technologies, yeah. um, and kind of you know how did you get into radio telemetry? Uh, well, let's see here. The I've always been had the general fascination with the radio in general, which got me into the, to, the, to the business at, at hand. But um, basically, as I was getting back in the to uh, rocketry back in 2009 after uh, being away since I was a teenager, I, I was suddenly became aware of how it far advanced the hobby became. And uh, in particular, uh, became aware of all these levels that you can qualify beyond just a person who flies the rocket in the park. So when you buy part uh, rockets at Estes um, and to fly in your little park, um, that's like level zero. And then the next level up is level one, where you get these more powerful motors. And and level zero means you could fly motors from half A's to A, B, C's, and D's all the way up to about a G motor. 
Um, level one allows you to fly G motors uh, up to H. And then level two is H to uh, K motors, I believe. And then level three is everything above that. Um, so as you get more and more powerful motors and bigger and bigger rockets, uh, you go higher and higher. So I'm watching level two people launch rockets and they're going two miles up, three, four miles up. So no matter how big your, ro big your rocket is, once you get beyond a mile, you can't see them. So at that point, people are looking and staring at the sky, waiting for you know some sign that everything went well or waiting for it to come back down. Um, the people who fascinated me were the ones who had uh, those Falcon trackers where you know they've got the Yagi antenna and their point waving in the sky. And, you know, the, the launch control guy would say, where's your rocket? And they wave it around until the signal gets strongest and they'll point where it is. And I was uh, going, that's cool. Um, I wonder if I can take it to the next level if I ever get to that point. <laughs> so that got my mind rolling as to, you know, what I could do with the things I've learned to uh, make it a fun hobby for me and take it to the next level for me. Um, we're going to look at, at pictures in a few minutes uh, of some of the systems that you've built, and you've designed some of your own systems and glommed onto that yes. uh, uh, commercial off-the-shelf parts as well to, to get the get the communications. Yes. Uh, so we're going to look at that in a few minutes, not not just yet. But I'm 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 curious about one thing. So um, I guess a, a lot of people who are into model rocketry design a lot of their own things because there maybe there's nothing commercial out there that exists. Mm. Now I'm a, I'm a little bit into drone flying. And of course, when you buy mm -hmm. a drone, you buy a, a 600 or a thousand dollar or a $2,000 DJI drone, it comes with lots of things to do telemetry. It, you know, you know, the mm -hmm. GPS coordinates of where the drone is, you, you get video from it. It even records and uploads to the web somewhere, uh, your flight okay. path. So that, you know, every, mm -hmm. every, anybody with access to that would know, ah, he flew uh, 412 feet above ground instead of 400. Uh, so all, mm -hmm. all that it gets to be available, a little creepy, but okay. Um, is, I guess what I'm asking is, isn't there just off the shelf kit that you can buy and stick into your, into your rocket? W why are you having to design a lot of this yourself? Um, there are off the shelf kits. Um, a lot of them tend to happen in parallel with what I'm doing. <laughs> so by mm. the time I design it, somebody's come up with something you can buy. Um, two reasons. One, um, I want these things to be in all my rockets that I'm flying. Um, and the off-the-shelf stuff tends to be pretty pricey. So uh, an equivalent system to what I'm designing would be about 400 bucks of worth of gear per rocket. Um, so that'll add up really fast. <laughs> so... <laughs> Whereas I can, you know, build it, you know, for a fraction of that cost as most any engineer that's known that over, that has a, a knack for building custom things for their their radio stations would know. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, time and and it's fun, you know, and, and it also allows me to expand. It forces myself to push the boundaries of what I know and learn more and and open up the possibilities to, to do even more. And and that's a spirit that's in the hobby that I like. So everyone that's into the rocketry, they bring their particular talent in. So um, there's a guy that does auto body finishing, um, mm. and and he's can you know he'll design a rocket just like anybody else. But he designed a couple of rockets. One of which was a um, a tenth scale um, Saturn V. So uh, it was thirty six feet tall. And that was the for the longest time the world record for the largest model rocket, and he launched it in Maryland. Um, but because he's got this experience with you know doing auto body um, work, he made the thing look pretty immaculate. It's, it was it looked like a NASA rocket in miniature, and, and in fact, after he flew it, NASA wanted it for display, and they have it now, and they <laughs> send it on tours to show people a Saturn V using the, a rocket he flew in Maryland. So that's another example. I'm into electronics and stuff, so I bring my you know knowledge in electronics and radio um, into the hobby for what I do. And uh, other people are great painters, and they can make a rocket with a beautiful finish. And other people are just really good at making aerodynamic designs and can make all kinds of you know rockets that look like they'll never fly, but they fly great because you know they're into that. And there are other segments where you actually have people who work at the the NASA uh, centers <laughs> who come in with the hobby and and have fun with the you know the rocketeers as well. I, I, it brings me back to my thinking about my own days as a kid uh, flying Estes rockets, building the kits and, and shooting them off. And we were I was just using the the A motors. I you know what I I think yeah I probably built something that had that used B and C motors as well. Does that sound right? As would a 
13, yes. 14 year old yes. could be using? Okay. Yes. A, B, and C motors. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. but you mentioned the, the guy who was actually his full time job was auto body and he built the beautiful Saturn V replica with a 10th scale. I'm thinking, with my experience, you know, the thing's going to crash and need to be repaired. So auto body would be the right background to have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> repair. Try, try to avoid, the, always avoid that. Yeah. Yes. So, so during today's show, we got a number of engineering things we're going to uh, uh, go through. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to give you a chance to really talk about your rocketry flight computer. That's a key. I mean, that's really what you've built. And around yes. that rocketry flight computer, you have transceiver, you have RF portions, GPS, uh, antenna mm-hmm. design goes into this. Yes. Um, you're looking at at uh, what they call LoRa technology, L-O-R-A technology. And then you've got to worry mm-hmm. about things like weight. I mean, a gram yes. or two can make an important difference. So... Yes. Yeah. All that's uh, all that's coming up. Corny, right now, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, a guy that you, both you and I know. He now owns a company called Angry Audio. You know, Mr. Dodge. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, Mr. Catfish. And yeah. And and uh, uh, the folks at Angry Audio have now fully own the Studio Hub line and the Studio Hub name. And here's what's even better. The Studio Hub equipment is now on sale. But you got to use a promo code when you're when you order it or buy it. Uh, it is um, get real twenty, and you get twenty percent off all genuine Studio Hub products. Now, if you're one of these people that looks to save money, and hey, well, we all are. We all want our budgets to to come in under budget, our spending to come in un- under budget. You may have looked at some of the unfortunate knockoffs of Studio Hub technology, and I'm talking about. Things like, uh, well, anything Studio Hub, but, you know, my, my favorite things are, are these. These are the Studio mm-hmm. Hub cable adapters uh, that go uh, plug into the equipment that you have and then go into a RJ45 uh, uh, socket and you plug your cable into here, your Cat5 cable, and run that however long you need to, to run it. Uh, it's got great common mode rejection. You may need to just put a little one-foot cable on there or put a long cable on there. This particular mm-hmm. uh, Studio Hub adapter, uh, male XLR, of course, they have them with female XLR. Here's one that's got quarter-inch tip ring sleeves that might plug into your your Marshall amp or you know, whatever you got. Hey, and if you've got yeah, an AES device, maybe you just need a little single one like this. So uh, you can go into an AES digital input on a piece of equipment uh, coming out of, a, out of a piece of gear. Whatever Studio Hub you need, it's now priced basically the same as the El Cheapo knockoffs. And you wouldn't want uh-huh. You really wouldn't want some some trusted, respected engineer friend to come into your your place and 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 see your really cheap knockoff stuff. Don't do it. Don't, just get the real stuff. Right. The real stuff is made with nice, really nice uh, uh, strain relief. Uh, the people at Studio Hub developed a fantastic system for injection molding the whole the whole thing right here. Good, safe, secure. These things don't fail. I've I've had hundreds of these, and every one of them works fantastic. It's one of the things I can truly count on. I can't count on myself to make a cable. I may have to make it twice, <laughs> but I can count on the Studio Hub gear. Uh, use the promo code GETREAL20 when you order Studio Hub. Uh, talk to your dealer. Say, I want my 20% discount, and uh, use GETREAL20 to get your 20% discount. That's going to put Studio Hub uh, right in line with uh, the pricing of, of the knockoff products as well. You can see the website, angryaudio.com. You can pre-choose the Studio Hub things that you need. And if you've got older Studio Hub gear, audio consoles, distribution amps, and so forth, those are still being serviced with the uh, with all the parts that are available. So check them out. Studio Hub, if, if you need some support, uh, call or email to, to Studio Hub, and they'll help you out. But when you place your order, ask for genuine Studio Hub gear. Thanks a lot, Angry Audio, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And thanks for the uh, the Studio Hub gear. I love this stuff. Why are yeah, studios much better? There's quite a few, quite a few of them hey, in have, this, have this studio here as we speak. Oh, oh really? I've got the the whole live wire thing in here, a little radius board and everything. So I've got Studio oh, Hub really? stuff going on in here too. You got more than I got. I mean, I use the, the Studio Hub adapters, but I don't have a radius board in in my studio right now. I, I <laughs> they're all at my radio stations. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> Let's let's talk. The, the key thing that you've told me about is the rocketry flight computer, and we add stuff onto that. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's do a little show and tell. Tell us what the flight computer okay. is and what it does. Why does a model rocket need a flight computer? Mine never did. What are you special? Ah. What? What's the deal? All right. I'll start uh, generically with what a, uh, the flight computer would do uh, in general on any rocket. Um, and what what you do when you get into the higher power rockets, you're flying, like I was saying, you know, way higher than you would with a with an SD's 
as this rocket. Uh, so you can, you know, be going you like for me, I haven't hit a mile yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, but you can go a mile, two, three miles up. And one of the key things when you go high like that is you don't want to have your parachute opening up at Apogee if you can help it. Um, that's when the rocket hits its highest point in, in um, flight. Um, because when if a parachute would open up there, you'll probably never see the rocket again. It'll just drift away into another county or whatever. So what the computers would do is uh, when your rocket launches, they, they're, they're constantly sensing things like the altitude of your rocket and all that. And you program them with what we call events in rocketry. So the first event would be what happens when your rocket hits Apogee. So you can have the flight computer uh, set off a little uh, pyrotechnic charge that'll open the rocket and uh, deploy a, a small parachute. So it'll slow down your rocket just enough and it'll fall more or less straight back down. Uh, yeah, there's a picture right there of my rocket at Apogee separated there and a little and that little ball at the, the top there, a little uh, fluorescent ball is the parachute. And in this instance here, I have a device called a chute release that's sensing the altitude of the whole uh, ball of wax there. So mm -hmm. basically, the, you, let the, you let the rocket come back down and at a predetermined altitude that you program into the flight computer, you say, this is where I want my main parachute to open. And uh, at that point, it, is, it could set off another pyrotechnic charge and open up a different section of the rocket that will then deploy your really big parachute to bring your rocket down nice and slow. And you generally are set that like, you know, or between uh, 600 feet or so to maybe 300 feet above the ground, depending on the, the characteristics of your rocket. And then that picture you just shown there, which was the rocket I did my big uh, telemetry test with this past week on the 25th of uh, July, I used a device called a chute release, which has its own little mini computer in it. And what it does is it'll hold your parachute closed as a package. And it's mm -hmm. sensing altitude the whole time. And, and in my case, I told it to let go of the parachute at 300 feet. And it'll let go of the parachute and, the, and it'll open up and the rocket will come down slowly at that point. So those, so those are what people mostly use these uh, flight computers for. <laughs> and along with that, you get the ability to uh, have logging as well. So it'll record everything that's going on, what it did into uh, memory. So when you get the rocket back, you can download the data on the computer and it'll graph out, you know, how high the rocket went, how fast it was, it was going and things like that. Um, so that's that's at its core what the uh, typical rocket flight computer would do. And um, yeah, uh, if you want to ask a question or I can jump into. Yeah, so, you know, whatever. so it sounds like the, the, pr the primary thing you're really interested in is accurate uh, deployment of 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 the drogue shoot at at, uh, at at apogee mm -hmm. and then deployment of the main yes. shoot uh if you deploy now of course in my rockets it would just deploy <laughs> you know somewhere up there maybe yes. it was still going yeah. up maybe it was falling down and and it, okay. then it would deploy yes. way up there and it, would, and it would float and float and float to the farmer's field past the school past the church past the dairy over to the next town and finally <laughs> land and and then we had to all run as kids to go find the rocket you're and, trying to and that's that. another thing. Yes. <laughs> and you point you made a, a point, too, that's that's nice with the flight computers and that when you're selecting a motor and it's hard for a lot of beginners to do this, but uh, you hang around with enough old timers and you get the feel for it. Um, there's a delay. You have like a say a C6 dash three. So C6 is the impulse class you know, that, that the motor is in. Um, and that dash number three will be a delay between the burnout and when the when the charge in the motor will go off and there's a little black powder cap in there so the the idea is to try to to optimize the delay um between burnout and when that charge goes off and and if you get it right you your rocket would just hit at at, uh, at apogee and then that charge that delay would go off and open your parachute if you get it too long your rocket would arc and, and continue on its way down and then the parachute will come off or if you get it too short it'll pop while your rocket's still going up and the, one of the nice things about the flight computers is that they're monitoring all that. So, um, so I use the motor delay as a backup. So I'll, that's going to be really long. So if something were to happen electronic wise or whatever, where the computer dies or some wire comes loose or something like that, the rocket's not going to come in ballistic like a like a a bomb or something. Uh, the motor mm -hmm. delay will eventually at least separate the rocket and it'll tumble down at that point. Uh, so yeah, that's another key thing that you. You pointed out when you're describing your story there. <laughs> uh, 
how uh, how are these devices, the ones you've talked about now, the the the, uh, the computer that's on board and the other the the shoot release thing that you said is a separate device? How do they determine mm-hmm. altitude? Generally speaking, most of them have a uh, barometric pressure sensor on board, uh, so they're you're you know so they're, they're determining altitude by the change in barometric, barometric pressure, and um, they don't have to know the absolute. Um, up high above sea level or anything like that. They're just sensing relative. Um, so it'll consider sitting at the ground to be zero feet. And once it sees that the rocket is no longer going up, um, it then says, okay, we must have made it to Apogee. And then it does it mm. the first event. And then the second event is when your main parachute opens. So barometric pressure and, hey, as a, as a pilot, and there, there are plenty of people who are pilots who uh, watch the show, uh, barometric pressure is pretty accurate way. If you calibrate it first, it's a pretty accurate way right. to determine altitude. What about uh, GPS, though? Because I, I, well, we're going to get into that, but I think you have some GPS uh, capability on mm-hmm. board. Yes. So um, this is where I start to diverge a little from the, the typical flight computer in that one of the things that I wanted to have was the that every rocketeer wants to have is a way to find your rocket easily after it's on the ground. Um, it could be that maybe your rocket went down and you don't really. It, typically, what happens when your rocket uh, lands, you try to get a line on something. So you will look at the horizon and you say, OK, I'm, where I'm standing now, my rocket just landed here. And behind the rocket is this funny looking tree. So that's my line. So I'm going to start walking towards that tree. And I know that I'm going to eventually walk across my rocket as long as I keep my bearing on that tree in the distance or whatever. It could be a water tower. It could be a whatever. You find some landmark and you start walking that lines up to where your rocket is. Um, Now, if you lose that uh, point of reference and no one else saw that or it can help you, you may or may not find the rocket. (laughs) And um, so so that's one thing. Another thing is when you're flying on farms, which we all are, because it's really the only area that you've got um, a lot of land for recovery space, uh, the crops can uh, really make it fun to find it. So uh, there, it's not unusual to fly in a farm where, you know, part of the farm, they've got uh, corn growing and the corn may be kind of high. And as luck would have it, you're the one that launches the rocket when the wind decides to shift when the parachute comes out and it takes it out over the cornfield and drops it somewhere in the middle of that. Um, then it's kind of an episode of children of the corn going through the stalks, trying to find where your rocket went, um, uh, or even worse than that, or soybeans where you don't think that's a big deal, but soybeans have this, um, innate ability to see a rocket coming and they'll open up their leaves just enough for the rocket to go in and cover them up. And it's like, nothing ever <laughs> I know happened. What they you, look know? Like. <laughs> you couldn't find anything in, in, in soybeans. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're right. right. They, they, they cover the ground with their leaves. Uh, at least corn has, so, you know, you got space between the the rows. And by the way, when when yeah. you're walking through a crop to go retrieve something, um, how much care do you give to not destroy any plants? We give a lot of care because uh, because we're there um, at the um, um, benefit. You know, we're benefited by farmers who will allow us to fly on their property, and we try not to cause any damage to the crops or anything like that because you know they're doing us a favor and and, and not yeah, very many yeah. people these days will say oh yeah you can you can come out with your rockets and launch them on my land sure you know <laughs> <laughs> okay so. i hear you i hear you so so uh now let, let's talk for a minute about uh what the, the, this computer that does this oh tell me about the, what's the barometric pressure sensor well, how do you buy one of these um, here is one of, uh, my flight computers. This is, uh, one that I, this, this is like my software development version. So all of this oh. here will be stuff that will live inside the, the rocket. And I don't know if I can get close enough on, on the camera here. I do have a picture somewhere. If I get my orientation, right? <laughs> okay. It says back. So this, yeah. So there's a little can right next to the capacitors here. And, um, my finger is going right, okay, right about there. It's a little uh-huh. okay. silver can, and that's the barometric pressure sensor. It's a tiny little thing. And you're writing software kind of that, that what t- t- takes a reading from that. I guess what you get a voltage yes. from that, and the, and you you digitize that, and and then actually, you have to calibrate it against something. Actually, it's it's it sets out uh, it it's, sends data out I squared C. So there's a, a oh. digital data stream with all that on there that you have to 
talk to it and, and it'll tell you the, the, the information you need to know. And then you have to interpret it into your software. So that's all of the fun stuff. So that's what the barometric pressure sensors look like. Um, and I've got another one that I'm going to be switching over to that's even smaller than that. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so you talk to that and you get the, uh, the data from that and you pull it, you know, off you know, quickly enough. Um, to, to make sure you don't lose any data because the rockets, when they're moving, they'll move pretty fast. Um, Mr. Bean, the rocket that I launched this weekend, that one uh, looks like it made it to about 200 some miles an hour peak. Uh, and that's fairly slow for, for a rocket these days. Uh, a lot of them would, especially when you're going up higher than that, you know, it's not unusual to hit Mach 1, Mach 2 uh, on the way really? up. So you've got to, it's got to be responsive. <laughs> I got to ask you now, is that, is that scale miles per hour or is that actual real miles per actual, hour? Actual. Whoa. So in scale, oh. that'd be really fast. Yes. Oh, gee. Wow. Wow. Okay. And, and, right. mock, and, and hitting <clears throat> mock has its own challenges when it comes to sensing um, barometric pressure because the shock wave will, will travel down the rocket. And if, once it goes across the sample port, it could trick the, the barometric, the, the computer software into thinking it made it an apogee. And it's not. It's going Mach 1 and still going. Yeah. They'll try to deploy yeah, parachutes you don't want, at that the, You that don't want shoot deployment of Mach yeah. 1. <laughs> it's right. bad for everybody. So you, to, so you have to write your code in such a way where, you know, it, it's expecting that and, and, and doesn't deploy parachutes under those conditions. So. Um, radio communications, at, at, at and you're, I believe you're using 2.4 gigahertz uh, as yes. your frequency band. Yes. It's, it's in the Wi-Fi band, but it's not Wi-Fi per se. It's just in that band, right. which is available right. to use. Um, when, you know, line of sight is great. I'm sure you can talk a long ways. My, mm -hmm. my drone is 5.8 gigahertz and I've certainly successfully flown it at a distance of two miles. Uh, so that's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about 11,000 feet away. Uh, now that's in a rural right. area with, with, you know, no other or very little other Wi-Fi around. But when the thing, when you're, when my drone is down, you know, near the treetop level, my reception and control, it, I don't have two miles. You know, I, I may have a couple right. thousand feet uh, or less. So right. when, when, the, when the rocket lands or when the rocket uh, it, yeah, falls to the earth and, it's, on and the ground. It's, it's out in the corn somewhere, are you getting any signal from it typically at that point? Well, it, it, I'm in the early phases of seeing just how robust it is. Um, in mm -hmm. this past uh, flight that I did, it wasn't too far away from things, but I had signal from it when it was on the ground. Um, but what my system will do is at the point that it loses contact with the rocket, it'll hold all the values um, that it received from whether from the GPS and all that. So that at that point, you can at least type in the last coordinates it got from the rocket before the signal went out with the idea of being that should get you close enough. And, uh, uh, and to help with that as well, I've got these uh, loud screamer devices on the rockets that will hurt your ears. It's like those, those personal protection on devices, mm -hmm. you can get a target where people can put on their purses and you pull the pin and it makes a loud noise to get everybody's attention. I use those in the rocket or rig them up in such a way where the pin gets pulled at Apogee when everything deploys. So if you're relatively close to the rocket, the idea is hopefully you can hear that that screamer going and just follow the sound from there. So get in I, the uh, neighborhood, I, follow the sound. After losing my drone a couple times, uh, I discovered something that I, I thought would be pretty helpful. And assuming that the battery was going to run run down, and I wouldn't be able to find it, uh, you know, during the during the day, um, I put some very reflective striping uh, on the drone. So if I went back at night with a flashlight, I would have some chance of getting a little <laughs> bit of a hint, even if it was down in the leaves, yes. like a little hint of, uh, oh look, there's something bright and shiny over there, right. uh, um, uh, in the bushes. I'll go there. <laughs> yes, recover my. <laughs> No, they're not raising stripes. They're just they're help the old band find it late at night stripes. Yes. Um uh okay, well that that's really cool that you, it, it saves the last good data that it got. So it, maybe it, maybe it got that, you know, 30 40 feet above the ground and uh, depending on what's right. between you and it and then you lost it. Right. Well, you've got you've got those numbers. It can't travel very far if it's, you know, right. just a, 100 feet off the ground and lands. Okay. That's cool. Well, I want to hear about the yeah. the RF, but I tell you, we're going to take a we're going to take a quick break here and hear from one of our our, our sponsors. Um, when we come back, we're going to hear about the the RF and how you've had to massage that 
to get good data back mm-hmm. and forth and what software you've had to write. So we'll 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 uh, we'll do that when we come back. This week in Radio Tech, right. I'm Kirk Harnack. We're talking with Cornelius Gould. Uh, he's an algor- an audio processing algorithm designer. He's designed some of the most uh, fantastic audio processing algorithms that are out there, uh, even starting from an early age. Broadcast engineer and also a model rocketry enthusiast and has designed a lot of his own stuff for model rocketry. He's really been into that. So we're going to keep, keep talking to Corny here in just a minute. Our show is brought to you in part by Broadcasters General Store, and they represent broadcast tools, the whole line of broadcast tools gear. And one of those things is this cute and effective little mixing console called the Pro Mix 4. Now, this console is not for every situation, but it's for some situations, it's exactly what you need. First of all, it's durable. You can beat this thing up because, you know, Don Wingett builds builds equipment that is very durable stuff and, and lasts, oh my goodness, we've got, we got broadcast tools gear at our stations that's got to be 35 years old and it still works. Broadcast Tools Pro Mix 4 is a small mixing console. It is mono. You don't have to worry about panning. The idea here is to get voices uh, back to where you need, whether it's just in the next room or maybe at a, at a, a radio remote, a ball game. Uh, the Pro Mix 4 is a full-featured audio mixing console. It's perfect for most any broadcast studio, but also excelling in the remote broadcasting and podcasting applications. It has three microphones uh, inputs, which can also be line inputs, so mic or line, as well as a dedicated line input that can be switched between a balanced line input and the internal USB codec. So that means you USB it over to your computer and you can use one of the the faders, one of the inputs as audio from your computer. It also gives you a program limiter because not everybody watches their levels properly, a balanced and an unbalanced mix bus and a mix minus output. So you want to put a phone caller on the air or maybe bring in a Skype call. Uh, You can do that and send proper mix minus back to the person at the other end of the phone or the Skype call or whatever you're using. Um, It has three independent headphone amps with IFB and program pan controls, along with a comprehensive studio monitoring system. Uh, Lots of good things about this you're going to like, like like XLR inputs we already talked about. It also has an XLR program output and quarter inch tip ring sleeve outputs and that USB output to connect it um, to your, your laptop computer. Uh, it can also drive multiple AHR1 headphone systems. So that's an accessory from Broadcast Tools. You've got a really complete system here for doing live remote broadcasts, studio work, and podcasting work. On-off controls on each one of these. And uh, there's also a, uh, a tally output. So you can light up that on-air light, which so many consoles don't let you do that. So check it out from Broadcast Tools. And the best way to do that is to go to Broadcasters General Store. That's bgs.cc. They got a website, but you know what I like to do? I like to call them at BGS, at Broadcaster General Store. Uh, they are there, you know, business hours across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast at 352-622-7700. Talk to any of my friends there, uh, Jonathan or Hugh um, or uh, uh, Jessica, um, Candace, any of them there. There's a, just a bunch of good folks who work there. Even Dave Kirsten. You could call Dave Kirsten, and and he'll help you right out. Broadcaster General Store, thank you so much, and thanks to Don Wingett at Broadcast Tools with the Pro Mix 4. All right, it's our 504th episode of This Week in Radio Tech, talking to Cornelius Gould. And, uh, yes, a little off topic from from broadcast radio, but we are talking radio. So, Corny, take us through a little bit about, about the actual radio telemetry, how you developed that and what you had to develop to in order to, to get telemetry back and forth to your rocket. All right. So um, where I started with this whole thing was um, the whole experiment is how much power do I need to get the kind of range that I'm looking for? Um, there, are, there are always the theoretical limits that you that they'll uh, the manufacturer of radio modems will tell you you can get. Um, so I had to uh, play that balancing game, you know, the, the amount of power, just enough power to do what I need to do. Um, because you, if you can transmit, say, a watt off your rocket and have no problem there, but that takes a lot of power. It needs, needs a heavy battery to do that, and that kind of takes away from what you can do with your rocket because you always have that that weight penalty you you pay whenever you're doing things. So it has to be something where the batteries are fairly light, um, but you can get the range that you're looking for. So the the one of the things that's uh, really revolutionized uh, hobby aviation with drones and all that are the lipo batteries, and um, and here's a uh, one of the uh, 
flight electronics that I'm working on for uh, the test after um, the rocket I'm flying now is done. And that's mm -hmm. the little LiPo battery over here, a little Turnergy battery. And I'm just... I'm looking at the, oh, there it is right there. And, there uh, and that one is, yeah, a little 300 milliamp hour battery, um, 7.4 volt jobby there. Um, and that's, that's the power budget I've got to work with. So with that, it drives a 60 milliwatt, um, radio modem, which in this case, the little XB, uh, device there. And, uh, so that's, you know, what I pretty much settle on and that should give me a two mile range. And so far, um, but these rockets here are, are or will make maybe a mild at the most. And so far, I haven't had any issues with that. But the next thing that uh, be besides that was making sure that I get all the data and not lose it. And so the first flights I had were the were radio modems that and receivers, transmitted receivers had just whip antennas on there. And I mm -hmm. figured it'll probably be an issue as the rocket moves around, but let's see how bad it is. So as the rocket would go up and it's, you know, getting apogee and that was really the biggest problem because the antenna went from a vertical orientation to a horizontal and on the ground it was vertical so that, so at apogee that would get a lot of dropouts of course uh with that and, and i'm at the mercy of whatever might be bouncing off of whatever that might orient the, the wave back to vertical enough to get a signal so it's pretty spotty um so what i was uh what i've gone to are circular polarized receivers so uh this is the receiver box that's hooked up to my uh radio telemetry receiver it's got the little led on there um so if the one of the cool things and this is where your hobby and my hobby kind of merge is mm -hmm. uh with drones people are getting you know wanting to get live video from their drones so in order to do that you know you, you go wireless and the drone people learn pretty quickly that the best way to do that is with a circular polarized antenna setup so that no matter what orientation the drone is in you get your signal so with that in mind, you can, you know, buy from the drone community, nice little antennas for, you know, at the frequencies we work at. And this is one for 2.4 gigs and it's, you know, circular polarized. So, uh, and this worked very well. I, it, it's it received the signal from launch to Apogee all the way back down. And on Mr. Bean, the rocket behind me that flew, it just has a little whip antenna on that one. There's nothing fancy going on. In fact, on its electronics package, the little whip antenna is right here um mm. sticking down off of the transmit um and that rocket was oriented all kinds of different ways and then the signal was solid the whole time it was always at 98 percent data recovery <laughs> so that made me happy um wow now for for the next uh phase of flights uh this is like the internal piece and it slides into the outer uh covering of the of the rocket components where the antenna would sit in this little uh, plastic area. And that's kind of like thinking mm -hmm. it as the radome for the antenna. So right now for me, just poking around, I just put this little whip antenna on the bottom of it. But um, for launch, I've got uh, from the drone community, another uh, right-hand circular polarized antenna here that would uh, screw onto the SMA connector here in the back. And this is the part that will live in the, the cowling. So now both the transmit wow. and receive antennas are circular polarized. Mm -hmm. So I'll be testing that out. And when this is ready to go, um, and I've got other antennas to play around, like the good old classic bat wing, <laughs> um, receive antenna too. So, uh, so that's kind of like, uh, the experiments I was, uh, working with, with, with antennas to make sure I get all the data back that I can, um, because there eventually there'll be more things going down on, the, on that signal. Now you were saying about the, the telemetry data. Um, <clears throat> I worked out a protocol that's pretty simple, um, where I, where I send, uh, a start and an end delimiter so that I can tell, you know, if I'm getting dropouts in the signal and it's, you know, it, it misses the first half, but it catches the middle all the way to the end. My software could at least tell that, okay, that's a parcel message, throw that out, wait for another start, you know, so look at the start marker and then, then read the array from there and, 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 uh, pull the data out from there. And that took a while to, to develop, um, as again, I'm pushing myself the learning more newer things. So I had to come up with ways to make it so that the um, protocol is robust enough to be able to pick out, you know, if there's a data drop in the middle somewhere to know that there is a data drop, fill in what it can and throw out everything else and wait for the next uh, uh, line of data to come in to fill out the rest. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> we can go on and on for that for, with that for a long time. But um, 
but that was another test when this uh, launch was, you know, if I lose any data, does it recover gracefully from it? And what little bit of that were lost, it, it did recover from that. So that was pretty cool. At what point from the receiver uh, to where the data gets logged or the data gets analyzed, at what point is are you doing sanity checking on the data you receive? Because, you know, you, you could get a, a, a bad bit and data would be you know, mm -hmm. way out of bounds from from where it should be. I I, I go for a walk oh, three or four times a week. Most of the time, my GPS tracker, uh, I use a, a program called Strava, uh, keeps track of me. But once in a while, um, if I go walk around a hill a little bit, all of a sudden it shows me at one point, you know, uh, half a mile away. And then in in a matter <laughs> of seconds, I got I got back on the trail, you know. And I, well, we're not mm -hmm. we're not sanitizing our data here. So how do you sanitize the data that that comes in? The, the, the quick and there are a couple of quick and dirty things. Um, the one is the nice thing about these XB radios right now that I'm using is that, uh, they've got the ability to do, uh, CRC checks, um, mm. between the transmit and receive so they can, so they have a, a, another protocol going where they could tell when there's a break in the data or something's corrupted. And then on top of that, I, I look, I do a check to make sure that, um, everything is within range of what I expect. And if it's not, it just throws it out. Now, as far as other, uh, things like bumps in the data and all that, um, you, that I can get around with good old fashioned filtering. And mm -hmm. this is where my audio processing stuff really kicked in and that these little sensors and even the GPS, um, uh, receive, uh, modules, they're fairly noisy. Um, so if you were to look at them and graph out, you'll see all this noise jumping around. And in the middle of all this noise is the is the data you want, the altitude and all that, uh, but it's like buried yeah. under noise. And when I saw that and looked at it, it's like, ah, I know how to deal with that. <laughs> it's time constants. So, um, <laughs> so it's a combination of that and, and a, a Kalman filter that I use uh, to smooth out that stuff to get the real data out of it. And the same thing can apply with the GPS because a lot of that is just inherent in the system too. If you were to look at the raw data on the GPS, setting a receiver like when i set one of these receivers on the table and i just watch what it does usually it's going to show where it is uh you know where you are but there's a little error rate that's about like 20 to 50 feet where it might jump over here and then come back again it might jump over there and come back here it might show it across the street and you know so that's kind of where you know where another again where this filtering works out in such a way where when it does that it jumps way out and comes back in you've constrained how quickly you're going to display that and it'll stay pretty much within the, the bubble of where it's at. So that's, those are some quick and dirty tricks that I've learned uh, to get around some of that. I've, uh, I, I learned something today, the, what, what a Coleman filter is. I'll put that in the show notes, a link to the Wikipedia article. And, uh, if we can study, study that together. Hey, we've got some pictures to go through. I'm sorry. We really hadn't gotten to very many of them. You, can we buzz through okay. some of these pictures and you, uh, and you can sure. before we run out of time. You can tell us what we got here. Sure. Oh, that's pretty. Look at that. Oh, yeah. cow. That, that is Mr. Bean on the liftoff. And one of the things I love, that's uh, using um, the, the propellant that these rockets, the higher power rockets are using is, called, is ammonium perchlorate, uh, which is the same kind of stuff that space shuttle boosters use and in, in big NASA rockets um, for solid propellant. So one of the cool things I like that you can see in that picture are the bits of the, the these little sparkly bits coming out, which is yeah. really like the a nozzle uh, blading away. Um, the nozzle material, which always looks hmm. cool when I zoom in on a on a on a shot like that. So that's the rocket lifting off. And like I said, the parachute in this rocket lives in this in the the air in that lower green section between where the fins stop and where that um, at the top of that uh, light colored band, which is silver there. And the mm -hmm. gray section of the rocket is where that uh, the electronics live with the radio okay. telemetry and, and sensing and all that. All right, what's next? Oh, okay, so that. That picture there is the results of the radio telemetry receiver um, after the flight was over. And uh, in the rocket was on the ground. I didn't turn it off yet. <laughs> so I just walked over and sat <laughs> on the ground and looked on the screen. And so the rocket's sitting on the ground, so it's zero feet currently. But the maximum altitude gets locked in once it sees it, uh, 1259. Now, one of the things I've discovered is that the, the library I was using for my barometric pressure sensor uh, didn't does not have a routine to... to uh, check the factory calibration on that. So I discovered in my lab here, you know, double checking what came back that the altitude was off by about 200 some feet. So it was actually 200 feet higher than what the display is showing you. So that's oh. something I've been working on since then. I've got that solved. Um, I'm sure you yeah, solved that. And I, and I hope you solve the problem with the, the temperature because that's pretty hot. 
<laughs> and now, now with the temperature there, <laughs> that's from the the outside temperature is about in the high 80s, 86, 87 degrees that day. And the yeah. rocket was sitting out in the field for a little bit, out in the sun on the launch pad for a little bit. So it was getting hotter and hotter on the launch pad, which isn't not unusual at all. Um, but yeah, so it was a little toasty in the electronics bay. <laughs> and right. then I have a... See what picture's next here. And then that's a zoomed oh, out yeah. uh, picture of the launch there. Uh, this, uh, that was a that was the first time I've launched that particular rocket. Um, my buddy Andrew, who built it, flew that many times, but uh, but that rocket flew straight as an arrow, and I, I can't wait to fly again. <laughs> that was fun to watch. And That's the rocket in the workshop. To get, and I get a sense of of scale there in my workshop. Uh, that was like a day or two before launch day. There's the antenna now on the uh, at my tent, which I nicknamed Mission Control. And my friend Andrew, that I got the rocket from, he was manning Mission Control on the on the two way radio, radioing to me out at the flight line what the data was coming in, which is kind of fun. But that's the antenna. It's on a pole. I try to get the antenna about 10, 15 feet up in the air so that the antenna can look down on most of the property. So when the rocket's on the ground wherever it is, it has a, uh, a good fighting chance of getting a signal even when it's on the ground. Um, even That's a good idea. Sure. Ah. And, uh, and, and that is the electronics I was just holding up and showing you. That's going into a, uh, another rocket maybe later this year, early next year for the next uh, trial tests where I start to you know do more than just testing the radial telemetry and the data parts of it. And that's actually having it control events. So that's what this part is being built to do. And you can see all the, the parts pieces laid out in, uh, in there with all my custom jumpers and, and all that. And uh, the green boards are boards I design and put together. And if it's a different color board, that's something that's commercially available that I just, you know, plugged in, programmed them up and wrote my software to talk to it all. And that's another, that's the uh, software development board, which is, you know, the same stuff that's in the rocket, but it's a, you know, a little better shot there. And you can see the little square, uh, not rectangular silver device there just to the left of the two capacitors in the middle of the board. That is the yeah. bar barometric pressure sensor there. Ah, uh, and, okay. And it was fun learning how to do surface mount soldering too. That was, that was fun. <laughs> I can imagine. So, so that, that the biggest board on there, that's of your design to hold all this together? Yes, the, the, the large okay. rectangular green board. And there's another green okay. board that the GPS plugs into and all that. The, those are, And the perf board on the top, that is emulating some of the other signals and continuity checks that the that it's looking for for the py pyrotechnic charges and all that. So I flipped the little dip, dip switches to test my code to make sure it's reading that stuff correctly and, and, and triggering the right things. Okay, I got two questions. Uh, the the, the uh, back on that picture, if you could, the XB module at the far right of that picture, right? Uh, that's that mm -hmm. the radio. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yep, that is okay, the right. radio modem. And on that day, I was testing out with just one of the the generic ones with a little whip antenna, but I've since uh, updated to the ones with the SMA connectors on it, so I can play with different antennas. Now, so you've mentioned several times the word pyrotechnic, and that's a little scary yes. to me. Uh, d d what do you do to make sure the pyrotechnics don't go off um, on the ground, on the workbench, <laughs> when, you're, when you're pouring over this stuff? What do you do to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, you try not to pour them in the, uh, over the workbench bench or anything like that. Basically, when I say pyrotechnics, it's basically um, black powder and electronic match, and they're in a little container. I use little centrifuge tubes. And what they're what they're for is when you set those off, they pressurize the the airframe of the rocket where the parachute is, and it forces the the parts with the you know the sections apart. Same kind of thing that the Estes motors does, except the Estes motors use the fire of the launch. Well, the Estes motor is a huge black powder thing anyway. The propellant's yeah, all yeah. black powder, um, and it's just some loose black powder at the top of it behind a clay cap that deploys your parachute. Um, yeah, right. So here, this is the way to have the electronics do that. And there's a whole safety protocol that we have in a hobby where your electronics are turned off until you get the rocket on the pad, pointed up, and then you turn them on. So in the event that something weird should happen and one of the charges goes off, it's not, you know, shooting a nose cone towards somebody in the crowd or another person at a yeah. pad or whatever. So there's, so they're pretty strict about that. And that's one of the things that keeps the, the hobby fairly safe. Um, so uh, on, again, the, on the they're, rocket, they're not, what, they're, it's not, oh, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> where, where, where do you put the on off switch? Okay. So, um, 
I use, there's all kinds of ways you can do this. Some people use Hall Effect switches and all that. I use these huh? little um, screw uh, switches where you screw them down, and it, and when the screw is up against the board, it makes contact between, you know, and it powers it up. And on the rocket itself, like it's on my stand here, uh, there's a little hole here where it says arm, and the little screw switch is behind the hole. So you stick the screwdriver in uh, there and you turn it until it, it. You know, till it bottoms out and it turns on. And that hole also doubles as a uh, sensor port for the barometric pressure sensor. Is that how Elon Musk does it too, just like that? You know, I, it, it, the funny thing is, is that so much of what goes on in big rocketry um, mm -hmm. mirrors the hobby stuff quite a bit. And, and I didn't really realize it until we started talking to some of the vendors that, uh, that sponsor my show, um, one of which is Matt Steele, who is a, uh, he is a professional rocket scientist. And he, and, you know, they design the boosters and stuff that go on rockets. But he, for fun, he flies rockets and he has a hobby company selling kits and supplies to all of us. And he was telling us stories how these little hobby altimeters and stuff are being used in, you know, they will attach them to things like the, the fairings to, you know, when the fairings separate and they get the fairings back, they read the altitude off of these little hobby uh, altimeters to see what height things happened and how high they got. And <laughs> so it's pretty funny how so much of what goes on in, in professional rocketry kind of mirrors what we're doing in the hobby, you know? You surprised and the heck out of me during uh, our, our pre-show talk when you said that th uh, there's actually a rocketry enthusiast who's working on a powered descent and landing yes. system for model rockets. Oh my God. I mean, this just blows the mind. H how does that possibly work? His name is Joe Barnard, and uh, and his uh, company is called BPS.Space, and he's been designing his own uh, flight computers and things. And one of the one of the challenges he took on is trying to get a rocket to land. It, he started off by designing uh, IMU systems that can gimbal a rocket motor, so you can launch a rocket without fins on it. And he successfully pulled that off. So you can have a rocket with no fins on it at all, launch it, and it'll go straight up using his stuff. Oh my gosh. And, and, he, uh -huh. and he gimbals the solid rocket motor around, just like NASA would gimbal a motor. And uh, so his next challenge was to have, using a solid rocket motor, which is really hard, um, to try to set it up so his computers can time it in such a way where the rocket will fall pretty much down and then fire the motor at just the right time to slow it down enough to get it to plop softly on the ground by the time the motor burns out. So he's close. He's been getting really close to that. <laughs> and I'll look at his videos and stuff that he posts and see how close he gets. And he'll, you know, publicly air that stuff live on YouTube and all that. So I'll put a link to his uh, website, bps.space, in the show notes. So if you don't uh, have a chance to go there right now, you can look at the show notes for this show. Yes. And, and uh, you'll, get, you'll get a link there. Uh, hey, Corny, we got to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, I will have some final thoughts from you, whether it's audio processing or rocketry, whatever we didn't get to talk about and you want to finish up, we will do. Sure. It's This Week in Radio Alrighty. Tech, our show number 504 with Cornelius Gould, uh, just a great broadcast engineer, audio algorithm designer, and uh, model rocketry uh, enthusiast. And, and uh, I'll call him an engineer because he sure seems to know a lot. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by my friend, my other friend, yes, I have two friends, uh, Josh Bone at Max Connect Wireless. This looks like an ordinary cradle point uh, 4G LTE modem, and it is. But what's inside it in terms of the SIM cards are not ordinary at all. Sure, you can get a cradle point modem or any, you know, my MiFi, that kind of thing, and get you some data. But that data is not going to be any more reliable than the local cell site and the number of people who are also trying to take up uh, bandwidth on that cell site. The thing about MaxConnect Wireless is it's prioritized data. Now, you won't get 30 megabits up and down. Uh, you don't need that for what you're doing. You want to get audio or maybe video uh, from wherever you are working remote uh, back to the radio station that you're working at, um, or we've used it here for the podcast. And Max Connect Wireless makes that happen because no matter how many people are using a given cell site, you get priority over everybody except for first responders. That means you can be at a stadium that is full of people in halftime. Okay, well, right now during COVID, it wouldn't be, but you know what I mean? You can be somewhere where there's a lot of people using their cell phones and you you get spits and spurts of data. You get drop packets. I know I've tried it. I've been in Las Vegas trying to do an SBE uh, meeting over video on a cell phone and it looked like it had plenty of, of uh, speed. And guess what? We kept getting lots of drop packets and it just didn't work well. 
but we whipped out the Max Connect wireless. The speed was slower, but still enough, and we didn't have drop packets. We had a great broadcast because of Max Connect wireless. So plenty of radio stations are using these now. Literally hundreds of, of these are out at radio stations right now, uh, providing data service to transmitter sites, backup STL paths to transmitter sites. Also good for remote broadcast. Take these out on the in on the road uh, and hook your remote broadcast kit up to this, and you've got 4G LTE data. You can get these with two SIM cards if you like. Uh, uh, Josh has worked out uh, agreements for prioritized data with AT&T, with Verizon, uh, with Sprint, and also with a Canadian provider too. So you can get the carrier that you want. This one happens to have both AT&T and Verizon in it. So I can switch carriers to whichever one is working best at a given location. Here's the website, maxconnectwireless.com. Yeah, it's spelled goofy. It's spelled funny. There's a link in the show notes. If you're not in a position to write that down or look at it right now, just go to our show notes and see it right there. Single carrier prioritized high-speed internet service for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. It's designed by a broadcast engineer for us broadcasters. Thanks a lot, Thanks a lot maxconnectwireless.com. All right, Corny, uh, we're going to have to go soon. So leave us with a final yes. thought, whatever it may be. It's up to you. What do you want us to know? Oh, man. Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> can't wait for the next uh, big test I have coming up. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah. What, 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 what is your next launch and what, you know, what system are you going to be testing out with it? Well, the next uh, launch is going to be whenever the window opens up weather-wise at that field mm. locally here. Um, one of the things that's been a problem was uh, COVID-19. Um, so a lot of gatherings were suspended, and that meant that my tests were delayed for months and months, for a good part of this year. And mm. the test I just did were was testing five or six different things all at once. And there were meant to be five or six different launches to test them where I can go through in an orderly fashion but the opportunity came up and i had all this code done it's like it's got to be an all-up test like the like the original saturn 5 ones you know to meet the deadline just have to throw the thing in the air and see if everything works you know <laughs> luckily everything worked you know it, the, the testing was all you know done i just found that one little issue with the library so mm -hmm. um hopefully in the next a month or so we'll get another launch in where i can uh do another test flight or two to see if this uh, error in the in the library is resolved, and then I start to move on to the next test, which will be a different rocket that will be testing out more of these uh, the functions that I'm not even bothering with right now, like controlling the events and stuff like that. So, so a, a lot of us got started with uh, Estes brand model rockets, and I'm sure their website, and I will put a link to it, mm -hmm. uh, is full of in information. But if people want to move up yes. a little bit more from that, or look at look for local uh, or regional rocketry clubs where they can kind of start to look at the the things that you're doing, uh, if they're interested in that, mm -hmm. what's a what's a good uh, organization or website to go for that? Um, you can always uh, check out uh, NAR.org, the National Association of Rocketry. They're one of the um, uh, national uh, organizations that certify us rocket launchers and uh, flyers and things. Uh, you can check out that website, and you've got resources resources mm -hmm. there. There's another one, a Tripoli uh, Rocket Association. They are, they are the hardcore folks. That, that, those are the experimental rocket guys and the ones that do a lot of the hardcore stuff like I'm doing. They'll, they'll even make their own propellants and things like that, and this stuff that the NAR doesn't do. So that's a, a resource for advanced stuff. Um, you can certainly check out the, the podcasts that I do um, where we yes, talk to a lot of yeah. the, the movers and shakers and stuff like that. And, uh, so the, the show for the advanced stuff again is the mo is, uh, the rocketry And mm -hmm. for beginner stuff, if you need to start from ground zero, because the rocketry show.com, you can pick an episode now and it'd be pretty daunting if you've never been in that advanced stuff. So the model right. rocket show.com is, you know, get you started with easy to understand, Estes level type, you know, model rocket stuff. And you can go from one show to the other and uh and learn more about that either through those websites or both through those websites and the shows that we produce. So man, I, I I'm on these sites. These are great. I'm gonna put these in the in the show notes. What great resources, and I'm glad they're all online here. This is this is <laughs> really nice. Thank you for providing that resource for people who want to learn about this. Oh, all no right. Problem. Um 
So when, when, when are we going to see an Omni 11 in, in a rocket? Is there any reason to do that? Well, you said smoothing data. That's important. Yes, yes, I've been using this. So I should point out too that Frank and I still call, collaborate collaborate with stuff, even though I'm not at full time at uh, at uh, Telus Alliance these days. So we've been collaborating on some stuff too. So there's there's still some stuff for me coming out. But yes, that the audio processing algorithms really came in handy in thinking of ways to smooth out all the <laughs> the data errors and things that just come out of left field on these sensors and GPS stuff. So it's funny how gotcha. that all comes Good together. Good deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, good deal. Uh, hey, uh, Corny, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and providing these resources. You, We're going to publish the show on, on YouTube. By the way, if you uh, if you watch or listen to the show on, on YouTube, um, and if you go to my website, thisweekinradiotech.com, or you go to gfqnetwork.com, um, and you watch or listen to the show there, you're, you're seeing it from YouTube when you watch those, those places. You should go to YouTube and subscribe to the channel and set the little thing to uh, alert you when we publish a new show. Typically, we publish shows on Friday uh, after we've recorded the show on Thursday, but we'd like you to get notified that there's a new show out there. And that really that, that helps us. And hey, if you want to comment, that'd be great. Uh, comments help feed the algorithm. So we'd love to hear from you that way, too. All right. Uh, Corny, I, listen, I appreciate again your, your, your time and talent and being with us. Next time, we'll talk about audio processing. How about that? That sounds good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kurt. Right. It's been nice Thank to you. be on the show. Uh, good deal. Uh, anytime. And thanks to our uh, producer, uh, Suncast, for producing This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks also to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, home of plenty of other cool podcasts. That's so you might like it. Check it out at gfqnetwork.com. I'm Kirk Harnack for This Week in Radio Tech. We'll see you next time.